Two months to primary day and district map making remains a mess. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jesse Balmert, State House reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer, Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Joseph Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. The deadline has passed for Ohio candidates to file to run for Congress. They still don't know who their voters will be, however. There is a congressional district map, version 2, approved by the Ohio Redistricting Commission this week. It carves the state into 15 districts. It's a little more competitive than the first version rejected by the Ohio Supreme Court. It essentially guarantees Republicans win at least 10 districts. Only three Democratic districts would be considered safe, while two others slightly lean Democratic. The map goes to the Supreme Court, where it will certainly face legal challenges. And of course, the Supreme Court is still deciding the fate of the third version of the state legislative map. Jesse Balmert, what's the thinking at the State House? Uh, will the Supreme Court go for this congressional map, this version two that was released this week? Yeah, I think predicting what the Ohio Supreme Court is going to do has been a risky business as of late, but the Supreme Court has struck down two different versions of the State House map and one version of the congressional map already. And some of the concerns that they've raised are that, you know, it's um, not getting close to the statewide voting preferences of Ohioans, which is an explicit requirement in the state house maps. And they're kind of implied a requirement on the congressional map. Um, these maps are, as you said, closer. There are about 10 Republicans safe seats. And then depending on what kind of year it is, Democrats could win anywhere, anywhere between two and five of those seats. But that's still short of, you know, strictly like an eight, seven or a nine, six kind of map. Mm -hmm. Terry Casey, uh, there, some of the counties remain more intact with this version than the first version, and you believe that's that helps the Republican leader's case in getting this one approved? Absolutely. The Supreme Court said fix things in Hamilton, Cuyahoga, and Summit County, and they did to keep them less split and uh, uh, less damaged. That way they kept all the major cities except Columbus whole and all in one district, which is Obviously important, Columbus, of course, can't be all in one district because Columbus is way too big to fit in one congressional district. So basically the Supreme Court said in the last time when they rejected it, these were the only issues they needed to fix. They did fix them if you actually read it. And the other thing is in the congressional language in the constitutional amendment, there's no requirement to shall attempt proportional representation. So people can say that's an intent or a like but that's not in the letter of the Ohio Constitution as it's written. But Joe Moss, in the first decision rejecting the map, they said that uh, they, didn't, they didn't reflect the will of the voters and this, or, the, or the proportionality of Ohio voters. Do you expect that to be still a, a factor in the Supreme Court's decision in this, this case? This absolutely, case? because I, yes, absolutely. I think that that's actually the heart and soul of the entire thing and, and the way that the Supreme Court has been looking at it. now. Let me hasten to add that I, I did see some of the recent orders. I read them this morning, and I also looked at the at the three maps. And uh, I think they're getting very close on the Ohio House maps, while the other ones still uh, will remain subject to criticism by the by the Supreme Court. So, if I had to predict, uh, I would say that that uh, perhaps the Ohio House map will be approved as is and the other two will not and as we record this program on friday afternoon the decision has not come down it could come down perhaps late friday uh, in the early evening as it i think it has in the past but jesse we still don't know about the state legislative maps and we're this just still continued uncertainty about this and everything's on hold at the state house until this gets settled correct Correct. I mean, and we're getting very close to important deadlines on the May 3rd primary. Um, the military and overseas votes, those have to be ready by March 18th. So that's coming up very soon. And you really can't vote if you don't know who is running in the race, who is trying to represent you in Columbus or in Washington, D.C. So it's a mess right now. Joe Moss, this, these maps are better for Democrats than the ones we currently have, and they're better than the ones that were first proposed. 
Is this really the best that Democrats can hope for? These these ver- these current I'm, versions. I'm going to give you two answers. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to kind of give you two answers because I think that what the goal, the partisan goal, on the part of uh, of Democrats is to have as many absolutely safe districts. And that actually was part of the argument when they sat down to negotiate the wording of the constitutional amendment. Uh, It's all about safety. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that I, well, I tell you, I do not agree uh, with that. Uh, But uh, the second answer is even within the context of having more competitive districts across the board, by the way, uh, I think that that the map is, uh, the, the, the maps are still unfair with respect to the expectations of Democrats. So that's why I say that we may have a partial victory in the part of Republicans uh, uh, fairly soon uh, on the House uh, districts, but not necessarily on the on the Senate and the congressional districts. Terry Casey, could Republicans have helped their case if they had one or two districts in the congressional map that were that were competitive? not necessarily safe? Well, one of the problems is there's some assumption that there's a mathematical formula that precisely predicts for each of the next five congressional elections how it'll turn out. And I remember in the 15th district right here in central Ohio, Chalmers Wiley, Deborah Price with the same district won big. Then they had two close races uh, that were literally photo finishes. And then in 2010, same district, Steve Stivers won by 13 points. And Republicans so have held that district easily since. some mathematical so, formula, but it doesn't work. Republicans have held that district easily since. So you could argue that Republicans saw those close races and said, we're going to fix that. We're going to make it easy for Steve Stivers and now Mike Carey to, to win that race. But in 06 and 08, they were both photo finishes with Deborah Price and Mary Jo Kilray and Steve Stivers. So my point is this obsession with a mathematical prediction of what will happen is not reality because it depends on the year. It depends on the candidates. It depends on the campaigns. And Stivers, well, they redid the maps after 06 and 08. And Stivers has won fairly easily since then. The Republicans have won fairly easily since then. Anyway, we still do not know for sure if Ohio will hold its primary on May 3rd and whether it will delay the primary or whether it will hold two primaries, maybe even more. Well, whenever it's or they are held, it will cost taxpayers more money than planned. State lawmakers this week approved spending an extra $9 million to help county election officials offset the expenses caused by all of this uncertainty. Terry Casey, you have a lot of experience in elections and election uh, management. Uh, Are they going to hold this primary on May 3rd? Well, there's no appetite in the state legislature today to move it back. But the reality is Frank LaRose is very specific. And I've talked to a wide range of election officials this past week. And some counties are well prepared, like in Delaware or somewhat in Franklin, but a lot of other counties don't have the printing. And one big thing is ballot rotation. You need to have ballot rotation. That ensures fairness for the candidates, whether your name begins with a W or begins with an A. But getting that right, because in Franklin County alone, they'd have to have 1,200 different ballot types to sort out and be ready, as Jesse noted, in just two weeks in order to send out to the overseas military and do it according to law. That's almost mission impossible. Rotation is where, you know, it's not always the same name up um, first on the list, getting that candidate uh, presumably, possibly an advantage. Uh, Jesse Balmer. We are, the filing deadline for Congress is today, but we don't know the maps yet. Um, what is the thinking at the State House? Why not just pull the plug and delay the primary until, until June? I think they just don't want to. Um, <laughs> and I, I think they're at a place where if either of these maps is rejected, if either the State House maps or the congressional map is rejected, they will have to move it. So either they will have to move it or the court will have to move it and we will be kind of past the point of no return. Joe Bastos, I mean, the the voters to keep up with this, I mean, they're not going to have people showing up on May 3rd if there's no election. Voters will 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 figure this out and they'll show up on the right day. Right. Uh, No, not necessarily. But let's not forget that we've had this stuff delayed very, very recently because of COVID anyway. So uh, presumably the people, particularly the people who are interested in primaries, will be uh, up to date on on, uh, the dates. But I agree with Terry 100 percent. 
I, I think there is no appetite right now. And the reason is because they want to put pressure on the Supreme Court to approve the maps as they are. And uh, I, I do agree also that it, it will have to be, the primary will have to be uh, pushed back. Terry, where do candidates stand on this? I mean, is it benefit candidates? I suppose if you're a Democrat looking to run for Congress, you, this really puts you in a bind. You don't know where to run. You know where you're going to, what where your house is going to be, what district they're going to be in. And uh, Republicans, they're, they're pretty safe in those districts. Democrats are the ones who have to be watching this very carefully. Well, the confusion is most people don't realize for Congress there's some latitude and flexibility because as long as you're a registered voter in Ohio, you can run in any congressional district. Uh, but it's very complicated, and some people hint at, well, why doesn't the court just move the election back? Because under the U.S. Constitution, only the state legislature can set the manner and the means of the election. So it takes an act of the legislature passed as an emergency in order to move that date of election back. So there's a lot of pressures and clearly there's some things that the Ohio Supreme Court might wish to do, but they can't do because they're legally prohibited from ordering such things. Okay, despite the election uncertainty, the campaigns continue. Jim Renacci continues to hit on Governor DeWine for just about everything. Nan Whaley and John Cranley seem to be running competitive but civil campaigns on the Democratic side for governor. And of course, the Republicans running for U.S. Senate are watching their email closely. They can't watch Twitter anymore, but they're watching their email closely for President Trump's endorsement. Joe Moss, first to the Democratic race for governor. It's still kind of flying under the radar. How, how do you see this race shaping out in the next two, maybe three months? Uh, Cranley and Whaley. I can tell you that the Whaley campaign, uh, I, I haven't seen uh, necessarily ads on, on either one of the candidates, but I, I, she sends out emails every single day. Uh, so you, you do have some people uh, working on the campaign, and I think that she has uh, probably the upper hand with respect to name recognition. She has the upper hand with respect to the expectations from a, a female uh, candidate. Uh, so that's where at least those two uh, might stand on the on the Democratic side. Now, it looks to me like uh, Mike DeWine is uh, certainly ahead on the polling with respect to the Republican uh, slate. Uh, but, you know, it remains to be seen. Everybody else is running to be not necessarily the best Republican, but the most Trumpian Republican. Sorry, Casey, there was a poll out this week uh, by Emerson. There was some, you know, dubious uh, methodology there, but it did show us some trends. Mike DeWine's approval rating is down to 45 percent, according to this poll. If you recall, the height of COVID, it was up in the 70s. Uh, is that something he should be worried about? Well, that poll was very flawed in both its small sample size, only 288 Republicans, and their failure to re uh, rotate the names, which gave uh, people like Blystone and Gibbons an advantage. But I think the poll does point out that people like Renacci uh, is struggling because he's in a field of three anti-incumbent folks against DeWine, and that splits up that anti-vote that always exists out there on any incumbent. But there's some other things that says some candidates have got a long way to go. And for the Democrats, for governor, when they're both at 16.7 among Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, that tells you that uh, a lot of people are either unexcited or uninformed about their candidates running for governor. Yeah, a lot of undecideds on the Democratic side. Jesse Balmer, it seems like Jim Renacci should be going after Joe Blystone more than Mike DeWine. Just give him some separation from, from his competitor on the, on the right side of the Republican Party. Yeah, I feel like all three of those candidates, Blystone and, and former state rep Ron Hood and former U.S. rep Jim Bernacy, what they really need is to clear the field. And I don't know if it's too late for that. Um, but if there were one candidate going against Mike DeWine and kind of the anti-DeWine sentiment that you have stemming from COVID-19 closures or, you know, past votes or what have you, they would have a shot. But when you're splitting the vote, it just seems... Mike Dwine's going to have a pretty clear path. Terry Casey, Ron Hood does have a uh, campaign website up for governor now. It took him a little while. Uh, it's a pretty thin website. Is he a real serious candidate or is he just a name on the ballot? No, I think he's serious. I've known him since the 1990s when he was a state representative from Mahoning County. He's got a lot of support among some people in the right to work field, also in the gun field. Uh, so I think what, like when he ran for Congress, he'll get some outside money 
he'll do some things. Uh, and he's definitely uh, not a shy guy who won't set off in the corner. He'll be doing some things. Uh, and uh, so expect a heated primary. But he's uh, he's way back in the polls and, of course, got a, got a kind of a late start compared to the, the other folks in that race. Well, Governor DeWine, of course, is the incumbent, but renacy has been running for quite some time, as has Blystone. Joe Mas, uh, the Democrats in the U.S. Senate race get overlooked. We have Tim Ryan, Morgan Harper. The polls showed Ryan in the in the lead again, the methodology to be questioned. But that that seems to be not a surprise there. Uh, and he's looking forward to November, I would guess. Yeah. And also the endorsement from the state uh, party. Uh, and, and, and he seems to be really way ahead. You know, he just came off uh, at least uh, a, an attempt at a candidacy for the for, for president uh, and got some visibility, name recognition and so on. So I, I think uh, unless something unusual happens uh, that Tim Ryan uh, should have uh, should should prevail in the primary. Jesse Balmer, there's been no none of the Republicans running for U.S. Senate, except for Bernie Moreno. He dropped out a couple of weeks ago, but none of the other ones have, have dropped off. They all feel, and the polls kind of indicate, even the ones that we've seen over the past month, that they are all fairly competitive. Even Matt Dolan has sort of risen a bit in the polls. So it looks like these candidates are in the, in the race to stay at this point, would you guess? Yeah, I think when you're looking at a plurality of the vote, when you just feel like you can slice off the section of voters of the GOP electorate that you can win, it it seems like a feasible option for a lot of these candidates. And so it, it will be interesting if anyone else drops out. I, I expect if former President Donald Trump ends up endorsing, that could clear the field a little bit. But if, if the former president doesn't get involved, you could see a pretty packed primary. Terry Casey, looking at the Texas results and Donald Trump's statements after the primary, he was stressing that candidates he picked won, which led me to believe that he's not going to pick a candidate in Ohio if there's any doubt that that person could not win. Bingo, you've won the prize. He's the kind of horse better that waits to see who's running down the stretch and who's ahead, and then he bets on that sure winner. So that's one of the reasons why it's, in my mind, highly doubtful that he'll make any endorsement either for governor or U.S. Senate because he won't see a clear winner or he has some people like in the Senate race where he has different people close to him who are close to certain of the candidates and he doesn't want to make those people angry. But the big thing is he doesn't want to bet on a losing horse or he wants to make sure it's a sure thing. Yeah, even Mike DeWine made a big deal out of that. He hired a, a former member of the Trump administration kind of way down the ladder in the Trump administration as, as a key communication staffer on his campaign. So they're all trying to get uh, that Trump vote. Uh, by this time next week, it looks like masks will be optional in public places in Columbus. Columbus City Schools will lift its mask mandate on Tuesday. The city of Columbus expects to do the same for stores and concert halls. OSU likely will lift its mask mandate next week. It's all because of the rate of transmission is going down. Columbus is just above the moderate transmission level. Those are the yellow counties on this map. Once Columbus gets below an average of 50 cases per 100,000 people, the CDC says masks are not necessary in public places. Terry Casey, the, the, the city's been very cautious waiting for this CDC level to get to that point. Is that, the, is that the right way to go? No, I think looking just at test results is, uh, it was the old way of doing it, but the more relevant measurement is what's happening in the ICU wards, what's happening in the hospitals. And clearly those numbers fortunately are way, way down. So clearly and also the public mood. I mean, we see this across the United States, Democrat governors that were slow to do away with the bans. Uh, people know we're only eight months away from the election and they know voters are tired of this and questioning whether it's all working quite as well. So clearly there's a big retreat. People are shifting gears. They're learning to live with it. Jesse Bomber, Columbus would be among the last uh, cities in the state to, to lift this this mask mandate. Uh, it's just part, part of the part of what's going on right now, which is a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting because other large cities in Ohio either haven't had these mask requirements for quite some time or they lifted them earlier. Obviously, Columbus has a, a larger population than some of those areas, but I think they're they're looking at the measures that Terry mentioned, the hospitalizations, the ICUs, and those are thankfully going down. Joe Mas, it's not a perhaps it's a coincidence, but the mask mandate will be in place throughout the 
uh, Arnold Festival, which, of course, was the kickoff to the debate cut, shut down uh, two years ago. Do you think that had something to do with it? All these folks coming in from around the country, even around the world, keep the mask mandate in place until they leave town, then, then let it go? A small price to pay. Absolutely. I think it makes all the sense of the world. You've got people coming in from not, all, not only all over the United States, but all over the world. And uh, why not? I mean, let's just go ahead and continue it. Uh, then we'll see Monday what happens in city council and uh, go on from there. Small price to pay. Joe, what behaviors do you think will remain after this, hopefully, pandemic fades away? I will tell you uh, a behavior, two behaviors that I would like to see. And that is what, what I, it's actually the status quo right now that is in public transportation. I would like for people to continue uh, with, with the masks uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the other one is if you're sick, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. I think that makes all the sense in the world. And um, I think it'll go a long way uh, towards controlling not only this, but the flu and everything else. Yeah, I think you're right about the if you're sick, stay home. I think that's been reinforced in workplaces all over the place. Hopefully that hopefully that at least sticks. Our last topic, Governor DeWine faces a tough decision after the 2019 Dayton mass shooting. He promised to do something about gun regulations. He tried to win passage of modest restrictions. They went nowhere in the state legislature. In fact, lawmakers have loosened gun rules and the governor has signed those changes. Now lawmakers have approved a bill that would allow all legal gun owners to carry hidden guns without a permit and without additional training. No longer would they be required to tell a police officer they are carrying a gun unless the officer asks. That bill now sits on the governor's desk. Jesse Baumert, where does the governor stand on this? Do we know? You know, I don't think he's made like an express statement about this, but I think he's likely to sign the legislation in part because in 2018 when he was campaigning, this is something that he said he would support or told people he would support. And so the changes would eliminate permits and training required to carry a concealed gun. Right now you have to go through a class and, and a sh short like shooting lesson. And also you have to meet certain requirements to get a permit and those would go away under this piece of legislation. This seems like a bill you might sign on a late Friday afternoon, but as of right now, early on Friday afternoon, he has not signed it. Terry Casey does, can he not, can he veto this and run in a primary two months later against more conservative I, Republicans? I think Jesse summarized it pretty well. He's basically indicated that it's going to be uh, signed and become law. And the real problem continues to be that when you have criminals, past convicted felons, et cetera, illegally getting guns, that's where the biggest problem is with most of the murders in Columbus. Uh, it's not with concealed carry people who are law abiding, et cetera. So I wish there was an easy solution because guns are part of the problem, but I'm not sure this change is going to substantially alter the realities of today. Joe Mice, I can see the ad, especially if Nan Whaley wins the primary, I can see the ad now, the video of the crowd in Dayton saying, chanting, do something. And then a image of Governor DeWine signing a bill uh, saying that he didn't do something. You can see that ad coming up in the fall. Well, I tell you what, when Jesse was uh, recapping the, the history on this, my recollection is that right after the Dayton massacre, that DeWine said that he was not going to sign in legislation expanding gun rights. However, he has since then. My guess is that he's not going to sign it, but he's going to let it become law because if he sits on it for 10 days, it becomes law anyway. So th that would be my guess uh, on this, if you want to take a bet on it. Jesse, has there been any talk of that, uh, how, how that process works, how you can sort of just sort of let it become law on its own? It's so, I mean, that's certainly an option. That's an option with any piece of legislation. So we shall see. But he still certainly will, will be asked about it in the, in the coming years, coming months, Terry. And how can he explain that the do something and then now loosening gun restrictions overall? Well, sometimes when you take the middle road of I'll let it become law without my signature, you end up making both sides unhappy. So my guess is I think Jesse had it nailed originally. He'll probably sign it because the reality is whether it's May or June, we got a primary coming up and uh, 
the legislature passed it. They might have the votes. I'm not sure to override it. So what's the point of stirring up that hornet's nest? Yeah. All right. It's time now for our final off the record parting shots, predictions, thoughts for the weeks ahead. Uh, Joseph Moss, you're up first. Mike, sort of a follow up to your question, because as we move on from the pandemic, an essential element of the return to normalcy is the great logic of if you're sick, stay home. A remaining problem, though, is the fragility of job protections, particularly in the public service industries. It is time to pass legislation to protect the jobs of folks who do the right thing and stay home when they or their children are sick. All right, Terry Casey, your final thought. In the upcoming Republican primary, I think there'll be three top people in the final three, and all three of them have money and resources and potentially with a June primary. If you have fuel for the tanks to keep firing, you're more likely to sustain yourself. The other people, I don't think, have the liquidity or cash to sustain themselves long term. Okay. And Jesse Balmer, your final thought. So in the governor's race, I had the opportunity to chat with Joe Blystone, who's kind of this outsider candidate for Ohio governor and fashions himself a cowboy. And he said that Everyone likes cowboys. Everybody likes John Wayne, unless you're a communist. <laughs> he is he is a character. You got to give Joe Blystone that. He's definitely getting attention, and he, he wins the lawn sign uh, competition so far. My final thought is Ohio Public Radio Stations this week announced a new collaborative led by WOSU, also public stations in Cleveland and Cincinnati and Yellow Springs. It's called the Ohio Newsroom. We're going to try, try to tell the stories outside of Columbus, outside of the State House. get to those parts of the state like Zanesville and Lima you don't hear from often. So look for that on your public radio stations and our website's coming up soon. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online at our website, wosu.org slash COTR. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.